howdy folks. This is Rory and this is the Daily Coin. And as many of you know, I am a daily contributor at SGT Report. And I have on the line today, Mr. Dave Kranzler. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing well, Rory. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Well, it's it's a pleasure speaking with you. And I love talking to Dave. He has uh, His website is Investment Research Dynamics. And not only does he uh, put out a lot of really great work about the precious metals and housing market in particular, but he, he has his own ideas that are based in market realities that he shares through his writings at his website. And we love his work at the Daily Coin and, and most of you out there that are listening, if not all of you, if you're not currently reading it and following his work, you need to. So with that, Dave, let's just jump right in. What do you say? Sounds good to me. So how are things going with you this morning? Well, they're just moving right along, my friend. Just trying to <laughs> stay ahead of uh, all of these encroaching, circling black swans and nightmares that are uh, just kind of taking over the news. Yeah, I hear you. It's a question of how much of it is 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 intended scare tactics and how much of it's real. I don't know if you remember that article I wrote, you know, back at the beginning of August uh, about Ebola and it being a crisis of opportunity. But I, I do kind of, I do remember that. You know, I mean, and, and one of the statistics that I cited was measles in 2012 and that there were 14 deaths per hour for an entire year in 2012 globally. Do you, I mean, that were directly related to measles, not a peep from anybody anywhere. I mean, nothing. Now we've got, while it's tragic, the situation with Ebola and the, the people that are that have contracted it and that are dying from it. I, I, you know, I feel for them and their families. However, it's not 14 people per hour for an entire year that are dying. Why didn't that get anybody's attention? Wasn't the opportune moment. Exactly. Plus well, there's measles vaccinations, you know, anytime you want it. Well, there is that. And, and they actually, um, did pass out like 140 million doses of measles vaccine. And they have the simple, the simplified measles only uh, vaccine. What year was this? What's that? What year was this? 2012. Yeah, I remember that. Because I remember when the vaccines got, you know, were passed around. And I'm thinking, man, forget it. Yeah. Well, there was the, the simple measles vaccine is, is, at nineteen dollars and and some odd change, and then they have the true cocktail that is for you know all of these different types of um, diseases and viruses that what is a hundred and twenty dollars and change, and we're talking about a lot of money. I mean, even at even if you take the median on that, say half got. The simple twenty dollar shot and half got a hundred and twenty dollar shot. We're not talking about a little bit of money here. We're talking about a lot of money at one hundred and forty million injections. So you're such a conspiracy theorist, Rory. Well, I mean, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> two and two still equals four. I don't care what Common Core says. <laughs> well, here's what here's what absolutely stuns me about this Ebola thing. Uh, it like it hit me. It's it. I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while, but it, it really started hitting, on, you know, falling on me like a ton of bricks yesterday. We've had, what, two confirmed cases in this country? Two confirmed cases, one death, out of 330 million people. I mean, your odds of getting Ebola, even if 100,000 people get it, 100,000 divided by 330 million, your odds of getting Ebola, you'd have a better shot at... at shooting a rubber band the length of a football field if you took enough shots at it. You'd have to have hundreds of millions of shots and maybe one, a gust of wind would come up and carry it 100 yards. Try to dig into it and write about it is 
what is the left hand doing while the right hand has us completely and utterly distracted with it? Exactly. That's a great. That's a great theme to write on. I mean, what are they doing? Because if we if we go back in history, we can look at these different situations where something like this came along and had everybody completely look watching the right hand while the left hand was just gutting them. And That's exactly right. That's it. But look what look what's it. going on. I mean, Connecticut signed that. The Connecticut governor signed that legislation that pretty much allows him to to um, have the power to impound anyone if they sneeze in public. Right. <laughs> you know, and now you got you got Dallas is going is is going to declare a state of disaster. Two people. It's a state of disaster. Are you kidding me? Well, the thing is, is that get it with Dallas. I mean, if they, you know, if they take some measures, because once a person comes into a hospital that has Ebola, that emergency room and that surgical area, they're, they're quarantined. You can't have any, anybody else in there. It's done. It's over. So that hospital for all intents and purposes becomes a hotel with an Ebola quarantine area. I, I kind of understand that with with Dallas because they got you've got to do something because right now it's it's running at about a fifty to sixty maybe a little higher uh, percentage uh, kill rate so that's that's pretty good if you get it your odds are pretty high at this point that you're not going to make it. I understood all that, but I mean, let's again just to go back to sheer numbers. Let's say two hundred people get it out of. I just pull up the population of Dallas is one point three million, so two hundred out of one point three. I mean, I think we have bigger problems in this country than than you know. If you want to just go by sheer percentages, you got you got children dying of starvation every day in this country, and that never gets published. Correct. So, you know, all of a sudden, Ebola, two people get it. I saw there, Zero Hedge had a photograph of a woman sitting in one of the Washington area airports. I don't remember if it was, if it was Dulles or National. But, uh, and she's got a hazmat suit on. And you can see from the picture that she was quite obese. And I'm thinking to myself, well, first of all, you've got zero chance of getting Ebola. Second of all, you should be a lot more concerned about the immediate health effects from being obese yeah. as in high blood pressure heart disease and diabetes she's, she's got a much she's got a hundred percent chance of dying of an obesity related disease and a zero percent chance of dying of a bowl and she's sitting there looking like a dope in a hazmat suit in this airport and i it just like i was like you know there's got to be a reason why all of a sudden they're they're flooding the airways with this ebola thing i mean in Outside of Dallas, I mean, are there any cities that are even at risk? Well, now the the attending nurse uh, did fly to into Ohio, and that's that's a, a serious situation. So we do have. So it's something you watch, but you don't sit there and you freak. You, why do you freak out the whole country over this? <laughs> right, I, I and I agree. I it's, mean, it's, it's your left hand, right hand thing. So there, something's going on that they want to use this as a distraction, and I, I think. I think a big part of it is, I think what we're going to see is the, the economy, if you really, you know, if you blow away the Orwellian fog that they, that they manufacture around all the economic data, et cetera, and you really look at the hard data, the economy is falling off a cliff. Yes. I mean, we saw it in the retail sales numbers yesterday, and that, those are Census Bureau government numbers, which means they've put their best massage job on those numbers before they release them to the public. and they're nominal numbers. They don't include, in, they're not in, adjusted for inflation. So you're looking, you know, so in other words, to the extent that price gains are built into the number that you see, that doesn't represent the actual decline in unit sales, right? Right. And it wasn't, it was almost every single retail sales business category where we had a decline. Yeah, so, so and that's coming from your article. Uh, did the U.S. economy hit a wall this summer? Yes. And I was I was reviewing that this morning, and just before we got on the call, and that is and 
to me, Dave, I want to go, I want to step back to the article that you wrote before that is the money printing facade cracking because these three, the Ebola with the right hand, left hand scenario, the retail sales falling off a cliff and the money pr printing facade cracking and you're at the opening of the opening paragraph in that says that you're yesterday I sent an email around to some colleagues in which I suggested that something nasty is going on behind the scenes in the financial system that is not yet apparent. That's the opening line. And in an earlier interview that you and I did, I believe that, that we were touching on that very thing. And as far as something is, has either blown up in the derivatives market or there's something that they know is going to blow up. I mean, is that kind of what you're alluding to, or am I off base? Um, well, I think I think it's a combination of that, and plus, I think there may be a big bank in this country that's in trouble. Well, I thought they were all in trouble. I mean, well, I mean, they're all in trouble, but it's, it's you know, there, there's there's being in trouble and having you know a lot of Fed Fed printed money sitting on your balance sheet, earning earning interest at the Federal Reserve. And then there's hitting the wall. I think I think I think one of the banks may be in big trouble, like liquidity issues. Okay. And again, it's it's impossible to prove, but if you just look at you know indications that you see in, in the market, I mean, to me that that's where you see clues. So, and and to me, one of the biggest indications is this is this remarkable plunge in the ten year yield, which tells you that a boatload of money is moving out of risk assets and into basically the only part of the yield curve that that it that you, where you don't have to go out 30 years that has a little bit of yield on it. I mean if you if you move your flight to safety money into very short paper you you're going to have negative carry on it. Okay. Because the rates are so low, but you can go out to 10 years and still get 2%. And and to me that's what happens when when there's a, a, a big problem in the system that, you know, it's not apparent. No, it was Goldcore this morning talking about flight to safety. Gold rises as stocks and European bonds again see sharp falls. The article is, is talking about people moving into gold as a safe haven. And, and there's been two or three articles in the past couple of days referencing that. And uh, Mark O'Byrne over at Goldcore just says flat out, that's what's happening. Do you, would you agree with that? Well, I don't. I don't know about people in this country moving into um, the precious metals as a flight to safety. I do think you're seeing a, you know, maybe a slightly higher percentage of, of the U.S. population because you're seeing gold eagle and silver eagle sales really spike higher, um, especially like in the last three weeks. Um, but again, I think you're talking about a very small percentage of the population, and it's it's the amount of if you measure it by the amount of gold and silver the public's buying per the mint numbers, and that and that doesn't capture all of it, obviously, but it captures probably a fair amount of it because um, it doesn't capture you know junk silver and things like that. But uh, um, you're talking about a very very small percentage of of the total gold and silver that's produced in a year globally. Um, yeah, there's a massive flight to safety movement into physical gold and silver going on in the Eastern Hemisphere. And But, you know, everyone who who goes to your website is already aware of that. And it looks like it's, it's picked up quite a bit. I mean, um, now that you have a new government over in India, it doesn't seem to be quite as beholden to the U.S., uh, and there was a report out the last couple of days, I've seen it in several spots, including from some Indian newspapers, that for the month of September, um, the amount of gold imported into India increased 450%. Yep. Now, it's a little bit deceptive there because in September last year, that was right after they imposed the really stiff import controls and and it, it almost basically shut off gold going into India, but it, it's still an enormous amount of gold. I think I think some of the initial estimates I've seen for September, and again, it's off the top of my head, around 130 tons just for September. That's a lot of gold, and that doesn't all include the amount of smuggled gold that's still going into there. Right. 
And, and then you combine that with, with China, you know, we had all summer long these, these Orwellian mass media reports that Chinese demand was tanking. Well, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the late spring this year, it was down versus the late spring of, of uh, 2013. But you got tough comparisons there because yes. that you know that was when when gold was was taken down quite a bit and and you had a huge spike in demand and over in in the eastern hemisphere and especially in China. So that's that that was very deceptive reporting. But now, as we're going into the strongest seasonal period in China, you're seeing a you're seeing a huge a huge increase in the amount of gold that's that's being imported and also. Um, withdrawn from the Shanghai Gold Exchange. My so the numbers is, that, that Kuz Jansen um, digs up every week. Yep. And he, do, he does an outstanding job. Does a great job with it. So My um, guess is, is that, there, yeah, that there, there's, there's a flight to safety going on, but it's not happening in this country. It may have picked <laughs> up a little bit. I do think at some point, I think I think a fair amount of people kind of bought into this economic, this this fake economic recovery that that we've been, you know, force fed from from Wall Street and DC and the media for the last couple of years, I, I think a lot of people kind of had hope and bought into it. And I think I think this time around, I don't know what what they can do, you know, short of just outright fraud in the in the reporting of the data i don't know what they can do to keep this thing from collapsing and again to tie that back to what's going on in the markets you're seeing this phenomenal collapse in the in the tenure yield and the, the short squeeze narrative that's out there doesn't doesn't explain it and because short squeezes are temporary but these the, the if you look at a if you look at a one-year graph of the 10-year yield, it's been a steady decline until the last uh, basically week or so, and then it's it's seriously plunged. Okay. And, and, the, and you coincide that with the remarkable plunge in the price of oil. And to me, oil directly reflects economic activity. I mean, yeah, there's short-term zigzags and manipulation and, and whatnot, but, you know, oil's been going down steadily since, since mid-June. So and you don't me, think... That's, that's really when the economic weakness started to set in again in this country. And so you don't see the, the slide in, in oil prices coming from the Gazprom, Russia, China contract? Or is, does that play a part in it at all? Or, is it, or do you see it strictly as an economic slowdown? Being I think right? it's an economic slowdown. Because if there was some sort of insidious or devious manipulation that was pushing the price of oil lower, Smart money would be buying up all the oil they, they could and stockpiling it because they would know that, you know, this, it's a manipulated hit on oil and it's going to snap back and it'd be very easy money to make. Okay. I, I mean, obviously, there's a massive, there's a huge global slowdown going on, economic slowdown, crash. Europe's crashing. I think our country's crashing. They're just packaging it up a lot more in a, in a much more pretty package over here than they do in Europe. And, and, and to that extent, I mean, you're, you're seeing that in, in the decline in, in gasoline consumption, retail sales, housing sales, when you strip away all the manipulation and, and you know, they, they manipulate the data and then they, then they turn it into an annualized rate, which is, I mean, that's just, that's, that's statistical abortion, basically. <laughs> But when you strip away all that, you can see that, um, yeah, there's been a, a, a serial decline in the housing market that you can tie back to last July. Yeah, and, and what's going on with the housing market, Dave? If you wouldn't mind uh, giving us an update on that. I know that you follow that very, very closely. Listeners really respect what you have to say about it. So what what is actually happening as far as the decline that, that you're referencing and what does that mean to what does that mean to me? Well, I think there's there's two primary factors there. We had so we had an engineered it was basically engineered by the Fed and the government through policies they implemented and obviously the QE. But you had an engineered bounce in the housing market okay. and it was it was stimulated by a massive influx of investor buying which was well publicized. Big institutions buying buying up distressed homes. It was predicated on on moving a lot of the foreclosed distressed homes 
into hedge funds and private equity funds. And and these guys were that this was money that was all looking Good. to look there, you know, it's money starving for assets with yield. So like, oh okay, we'll buy up hundreds of thousands of homes, turn them into rentals, and then when the market comes back, we'll unload the the homes in a nice gain. So and and everyone knows about the close to two trillion that the Fed pumped into the mortgage market. Well, most people aren't aware of this, but the, the government, government gave them free financing for that. So, so a lot of that, you know, the big bounce that you saw in, in, in the quote unquote investor buying, um, was engineered by the Fed and the government. And it's artificial. And, and then you had, you know, the individual flipper investors basically came in again at the end, as they always do. And a lot of them are going to get scalped because they're going to be left holding homes that they can't sell, at least at the price they paid. Well, meanwhile, beneath the surface, what was going on was that you had a decline in basically the traditional organic home buying market, which is, you know, your first time buyer and your move up buyer. Um, the first time buyer historically has been 40% of the housing market. It's down to below 30% now. And if, if the first time buyer isn't, isn't buying a home, that means your move up buyer is is handcuffed in the home that they've got because they rely on selling their home to the first time buyer. I'm primarily talking about the existing home sales data because that's 90% of the sales volume in the housing market. Wow. Okay. Um so so what you've had here is beneath the surface of this quote unquote housing market recovery that we saw was the the fundamental organic market continued to deteriorate and it was deteriorating despite lower interest rates. And, and we've seen that in the mortgage purchase application numbers, which they've basically been declining now since the middle of last summer, almost every week. I mean, there's some weeks where you get a bounce, but almost every week they're declining. So, so you've had, now that the, the investor buyers are, are loaded up, they're, they're, they're sitting on portfolios that they're having trouble renting out. Um, so they've basically pulled away from the market and you're seeing that, you're seeing that in the numbers. And the numbers are more prevalent in the West because that's this dynamic was going on a lot was a lot more prevalent in the West than it was in the in the, in the Northeast. So um, you're seeing the, the investor buyers pull away. Your organic first time buyer is is disappearing, and obviously that's because you know your average household under the age of 35 isn't making enough money to support a home. Right. And then what's going to make it even more interesting, and this is exactly what happened in, when the big bubble popped, is that all of a sudden you had this huge spike in multifamily housing starts, and that's been kind of driving the housing starts number for um, the last year, for the most part. And, and what's going to happen is you're going to have all these huge apartment building projects come online just as the rug is being pulled out from beneath the housing market. And you're starting to see a lot more homes that are coming onto the market for rent. And that, that's showing up in the data all over the place. So, so you're going to see, you're gonna see uh, rents go down, and you're going to see flippers stuck with homes, and you're going to see a lot of people who are, gonna, who are listing their house thinking that they're going to get a great price for their house that they're not going to be able to get. And, and, and that's another aspect in, in the data that I've been watching is that the inventories of both existing homes and the inventories of new homes are starting to increase by quite a bit. And that's not something that should be happening, especially at this time of the year, because we're entering into the lowest seasonal part of the year. And yet, every time they release more data, inventories keep expanding. So um, uh, it's going to take place in a slightly different form than the, than the original popping of the big bubble, which was, which was driven by the collapse in subprime garbage paper that was being used to finance these homes um but you know the housing market's gonna gonna collapse again do you think that the that the federal reserve with their pump and dump schemes like the the housing market that you just described do you think that they're able to go in and target specific markets to rally the that market or to destroy that market like for example say detroit we all know that detroit has much bigger problems than their housing uh, than their housing market, but just as an example, something that people can look at that Detroit is in a shambles. But their mark, their housing market, can they target that for destruction and say some somewhere like San Francisco 
they can target target it for a, a rally. Is that do you think that that's possible, or am I just way out in the weeds? Well, what, I don't know what the motivation would be. What, why would they want to level Detroit and prop up San Francisco? I, I think they can, I can, I can, they can set policies to try and stimulate housing. Actually, Detroit, you know, if you go by the, the, the price data that gets published every month, especially Case Shiller, Detroit, Detroit's had a pretty, pretty big pop in, in prices, but that's because you've had a home that's gone from 10,000 to 20,000. So on a, per, <laughs> on a percentage basis, it looks like a nice gain. Well, that's, that's investment buyers going in there and, and they're buying up $10,000 homes and renting them out to people who can barely afford them. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the motive would be to maybe level a city and prop up a city. I, I think I think the Fed kind of targets monetary policy to try and stimulate, and I think they've been trying to stimulate the whole country, and you had a, a brief period of stimulation. Obviously, San Francisco is a good example. San Francisco happens to be rolling over very quickly, especially prices there, and it's exact. San Francisco led, led the country in rolling over when the first housing bubble popped. So, um, and that's, is that what we're seeing right now also? I think so. Yeah. That's, that's what I think is going on. Um, I think the only thing the fed could do to really help out the housing market, it would be to just go out and print money and just buy up homes and stockpile them. Okay. You, you remember, I don't know if you remember this in the, in the seventies, um, there was a huge surplus of airplanes and, the airlines were, were, were parking hundreds of, of, of unused jets over in the desert in Saudi Arabia and in, in Southern California and, in, in, um, you know, in, in the desert in, in Southern California. You'd see pictures of just hundreds and hundreds of jets just sitting there in the middle of nowhere. They were just taking that capacity off the market. Wow. You know, maybe, you know, the, could the Fed do something like that in housing? I'd be shocked if they did. Okay. But anything's possible. Who knows? I mean, everything that's gone on in the last three or four years has shocked me. Well, what do you what do you see for the remainder of 2014 as far as both the economy and for the precious metals? Is the bottom end? Do you think for the precious metals market? Do you think that that it's going to continue in this sub 1300 for gold and sub 20 for silver or do you think that there's some type of rally that i've heard uh several people say that there's going to be that's a great question rory i wish i had the answer to that because i i wouldn't tell anyone and i'd go somewhere and do trades in secret and try to make a lot of money off of it but uh <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is your crystal ball is in the shop and and probably not coming out anytime soon i don't think anyone has a crystal ball that works because if you had a crystal ball that worked you wouldn't share it with anyone, right? You would go somewhere and and secretly implement your trading strategy because you wouldn't want anyone else to know about it, right? The markets are, you know, they're still efficient to a degree. And if other people started using your trading strategy, it would get priced into the market very quickly, right? Yep. So if I had a crystal ball where I could see for certainty what's going to go on, I wouldn't tell anyone. I'd just go and take advantage of it. But, um... I don't know. Every every year we've, we've since since um, 2011, everyone comes out and says, "Okay, well, we're going to be higher by the end of the year." And I don't know. I mean, I think right now the market is 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 being held captive by the enormous paper manipulation that's going on, and 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 the degree of the manipulation. First of all, I do think there's validity to the idea that they. The bullion banks have a bigger problem, and the central banks have a bigger problem with with physical silver, because um, it, I mean the, the manipulation in silver has just been incredibly intense, and and we know that India and China are are hoovering up silver not just as an investment metal, but because they both have huge solar programs going on. Mm -hmm. We know the public here is is consuming silver eagles. I think this year we're at a run right now that will exceed the amount of silver that's produced in this country. Um, and a few years ago, Congress passed a law. Originally, every silver eagle that was sold in this country had to be minted from silver mined in this country. Yes. Well, and then when, when, the, when the consumption of silver eagle started rising dramatically, they had to 
change the law. So now a lot of the silver eagles that get purchased in this country are minted from silver that comes from Mexico. If you look at just the open interest on the on the COMEX in silver futures, the open interest typically moves in correlation with the price of silver. So as the price of silver moves up, the open interest goes up, and vice versa. As the price of silver goes down, the open interest declines. Well, right now, you know, we're at the very low end of the price range for silver over a long period of time, and yet the open interest is is almost at all-time record levels. So what that tells me is that the bullion banks have had to suppress the price with a lot more paper. In other words, it's taken them as much paper as it takes them to control the market when it's moving higher. They've had to print and feed into the market that amount of paper just to keep the price down to this level. And again, I think it's, I really think they have um, delivery issues in, in, in physical silver. And interestingly, um, over the last probably year or 18 months, there's been an enormous amount of movement of silver in and out of the COMEX to the extent that you can believe the numbers that they report for the COMEX vaults. They get reported every day. Been an enormous amount of movement in and out. And we've never seen movement in and out of the COMEX vaults like this. Even when silver was was moving from last time around when it moved from eight up to forty nine, we didn't see movement in and out of the COMEX vault. And I have a feeling there's a there's kind of a, a shell game going on between SLV and the COMEX because that was another thing. I think it was two thousand ten. I don't remember the specific date, but the SLV trust has been around for a long time. In two thousand and ten, they amended the prospectus so that silver could be kept for the SLV trust by J.P. Morgan, both in New York and in London, right? right. So like with GLD, the gold, all the gold has to be kept in, in, well, theoretically has to be kept in London vaults. But with silver, with J.P. Morgan as the custodian of SLV, silver can be kept in, in London and New York. And I think it gave them the ability to move silver between the SLV account and their COMEX uh, vault accounts, hmm. you know, at free will. I mean, J.P. Morgan, I, again, I, I think it was 2009 or 2010 when J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan wasn't even a, a, a vault custodian for the COMEX until like 2009, 2010. I, right. I don't remember the exact date. The listeners can look it up. But they went from not being a vault custodian in silver to being the largest vault custodian. So there's something going on there. Do you think that this is, that the price manipulation is somehow tied to the treasury market or the bond market in that as long as they can keep the price down and allow the Chinese to get as much physical as they want, that, that, that does that play a part in, in this manipulation? Do you think? I know, I know that theory is out there and I don't, I don't know, you know, who knows? It's to me, that's just idle speculation. It's okay. a possibility, but I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the, the truth is, the Treasury market and the U.S. dollar is one big pris prisoner's dilemma issue, right? Okay. As long as everyone sticks to their story, i.e., in this case, as long as no one sells their treasuries, the market's not going to collapse, right? Right. So, so I mean, yeah, China could, could threaten the U.S. to sell treasuries, and then the U.S. say, go ahead, you know, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. I mean... China's got, uh, you know, what, probably a third of their reserves are still sitting in treasury, something like that. Yep. I mean, I don't think they want to destroy their wealth by, by dumping treasuries on the market just to, just to piss off the United States. But oh, to get right. back to the manipulation of the silver and tie it to the dollar and interest rates, yeah, abs or especially gold, absolutely. The Fed can't keep spinning this fairy tale of low interest rates if the price of gold is going through the roof. Right. I mean, the Fed's trying to feed us this baloney that there's no inflation and interest rates are, are, are low, you know, 0% zero, zero interest rates because there's no inflation. So we're, we're good. <laughs> well, guess what? Why don't, why don't you shut down the COMEX for a week and let's see what happens to the price of gold and then tell us how good your story is. Wouldn't work. Exactly. So in order for them to have a consistent, to be consistent with the narrative of no inflation, improving economy, Low interest rate policy is fine. We can print money. 
you have to keep a lid on the price of gold. Otherwise, no one believes the story. Well, I don't believe any of it anyway, so. Exactly. Here, here's actually, now that I think about it, this would be a great idea. Okay, if the U.S. government and the Fed and the bullion banks want to prove to the world that the COMEX isn't manipulating, isn't, isn't the catalyst to manipulate the price of gold and silver, why don't they just shut it down for a month and let the rest of the world operate as is and let's see what happens to the price of gold and silver. Right, if, if that happened, then I could put a price prediction on the price of gold and silver for the end of the year. 2050. If the COMEX were shut down for a month, just stopped operations. Then we would actually see that there isn't any available. That's right. Notice how I said 2050 by the end of the year. I didn't say next year. Yes, I, I, I caught that. <laughs> <laughs> you would see gold and silver go bid without, meaning you'd have buyers driving the price up and there wouldn't be any offers of physical gold and silver. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, offer any of mine back to the market. Not today, not tomorrow, not any time. That, that's that's my what was that what was that challenge that was going around the the ice bucket challenge or something? Yeah, that's this is my this is my precious metals challenge. Let's 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 say that the, the U.S. has to shut down the COMEX and the London has to shut down LBMA forward trading, not the physical trading, the forward trading. They have to shut it down for a month, and let's see what happens to the price of gold and silver. So that that's my. That's my precious metals challenge to to the Fed and the Bank of England. <laughs> I don't believe you'll get any takers, but... <laughs> I don't think there'll be anyone. <laughs> well, at least on that side of the fence. I think everyone listening to this program would take our side of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd be <laughs> oh, all over it. That? Yeah, we'll donate money to see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, Dave, I think that's probably a good place to... Uh, to end this with a with a good laugh and uh, a little hope out there. So I really appreciate all your time today and all your insight. It's always welcome. My my pleasure, Rory. I, I love chatting with you. You're you're doing a great job with your website, and you're you're exposing and exploring a lot of issues that um, you know for people who only get their news from from cable news. Um, have no idea about what's going on, but if they go to your website, it's it's an eye opener. Well, I certainly appreciate that. It's very kind. Well, and and right back at you. I mean, the the work that you're doing, Dave, is just off the chart. No pun intended, but it's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's really the readers that that come to the Daily Coin that find that find your work there and at SGT Report and the various other websites that your work is carried. I mean, it, it's you're you're moving mountains, my friend. I mean, as far as educating people and giving them an opportunity to be educated because it's your insight, it's your knowledge that helps me and helps everybody to find better footing for what's actually happening, the reality of the situation. So right back at you, my friend. Thanks. I appreciate the feedback. I think we all do kind of a good job of feeding off each other and, and, and helping to sort of blow away that Orwellian fog. I like that term, actually, a lot. Orwellian fog. That's, whew, my God. But <laughs> 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 well, let's, uh, let's do this again uh, in, a, in a few weeks, Dave, just to keep, because I, I really want to try to keep, uh, uh, keep in touch going into year end because and and in particular this month i think that it's important to get an update because of the october surprises and and ebola may be that you, you know i've heard speculation on that so hopefully we can uh, we can catch up in, in two or three weeks and, and see what's going on see how that, that pans out for the holiday season anytime rory just let me know all right buddy i'll talk to you soon i'll talk to you soon